Teleportation, the ability to travel great distances in an instant, has fascinated people for ages. The idea of instantly moving from one place to another is common in science fiction, like in the Star Trek universe, where people and objects can be instantly transported to a spaceship or a distant planet, the concept of teleportation is not just limited to fiction, it's being seriously explored by science. Making teleportation a reality in the real world is an incredible achievement that requires understanding beyond our current knowledge. While the idea of teleportation may seem far-fetched, there are strange stories suggesting that human teleportation might have already happened. Throughout history, there are accounts of people mysteriously appearing in faraway locations, and these stories persist even today. The alleged cases involve mysterious portals to other dimensions, strange doorways that open into the fabric of reality, and the bending of the rules of physics. Some believe these events occur through forces we can't comprehend, reports of real-life teleportation span different points in history, and here are five such cases for consideration. Gil Perez served as a Spanish soldier during the early years when Spain ruled the Philippines. As a member of the Guardia Civil, he had the duty of being a palace guard for the Gobernator General. In October 1593, a significant event unfolded when the 7th Gobernator General, Gomez Perez das Marinas, was assassinated by Chinese pirates during an expedition in the Moluccas. Following das Marinas' death, chaos ensued as there was no clear successor, leading to various prominent Spaniards competing for the position. During this tense period, Perez, while on guard duty at the palace, experienced an unexpected episode. Feeling dizzy and exhausted, he leaned against a wall and briefly dozed off. To his surprise, upon waking up, he found himself in an entirely different location, confused about his surroundings, Perez inquired from a bystander and learned that he was in Plaza Mayor, now known as Zocalo, in Mexico City. Word spread about Perez's unusual journey in his distinct Manila uniform, reaching the guards in New Spain. Authorities, including the Viceroy of New Spain, Luis de Velasco, took notice and brought Perez to them, with his unexpected destination being the Palace of Velasco. Even though Perez was really surprised, he managed to answer all their questions very well. He talked about the assassination of Das Marinas in a lot of detail, even though it had just happened the night before and wouldn't be proven for months. The Viceroy was happy with Perez's explanations, but soon religious officials got involved. They handed him over to the Holy Office of the Inquisition, also known as the Spanish Inquisition, for more questioning. Perez was taken from Mexico to Santo Domingo in the Caribbean, where he was put in jail for desertion and being called a servant of the devil. As a loyal and honored soldier, Perez faced challenges with courage and worked well with the authorities. Some even said he'd rather be in jail than fight the jungle men in the Philippines. Later, it turned out he was a devoted Christian, and because of his good behavior, he wasn't accused of any crimes. However, the authorities were unsure how to handle the unique situation and kept him in prison until they reached a decision. One day, a Spanish ship arrived in Acapulco, confirming all Perez's statements about the Gobernador General. He was summoned back to Mexico, where some passengers recognized him as a palace guard. As a result, he was released and sent back to Manila on the next ship. Sister Maria, the fourth child of Francis and Catherine Corano, was born on April 2, 1602. Her mom lovingly called her a special blessing because her birth brought relatively little suffering. Coming from a Spanish noble family with their own castle, Maria showed signs of unusual abilities early on. At the age of two, her parents noticed her remarkable reasoning skills. By four, they thought she might be hearing messages from God, as she often spoke and played with invisible friends. At six, they became concerned about her strong focus on spirituality and intense compassion for the poor, 
when Maria turned eight, she took a vow of chastity and expressed her desire to join the sisterhood. At twelve, with her parents' approval, she was ready to enter the Sisters of Teresa Convent of St. Anne. However, an unexpected twist occurred. While praying, her mom received a divine instruction to convert their castle into a convent for the poor clares, donate their possessions to the needy, and embrace a life of service to the church. Maria, her sister, and her parents were to enter the convent and monastery, respectively. At seventeen, Maria, now a beautiful young woman, donned a simple blue and gray habit of a Franciscan nun. She wore a rope with three knots, symbolizing poverty, chastity, and obedience, and a Franciscan crown rosary representing the joys of the Blessed Virgin. Taking the name Sister Maria a Jesus de Agreda, she began her life in the convent. At 18, during prayer, Sister Maria experienced something extraordinary. As she chanted, her face grew pale, and she seemed to lose consciousness. A beggar witnessed her body levitating in a brilliant blue light several feet above the floor. This marked the first of more than 500 teleportation experiences throughout her lifetime. And so, during her first time teleporting, she began a series of more than 500 such journeys. Some days, she managed two or three bilocations, reaching the land of the Red Indians. Speaking to them in their own language, she taught the fundamentals of the faith and handed out rosaries from her cell. Healing the sick and gaining converts, she encouraged them to connect with Franciscan friars and requested new missions for other tribes. She even expressed her willingness to sacrifice her life to save a single Indian soul. In addition to the visions documented in books, Sister Maria experienced cataleptic trances between 1620 and 1631. After these episodes, she described a dream where she was transported to a strange land, teaching the gospel to unfamiliar people, between 1621 and 1629. Missionaries in Texas and New Mexico encountered Indians untouched by Spaniards or Frenchmen, speaking their own languages, yet practicing Catholic rituals taught by a mysterious woman in blue. When questioned, these Indians claimed the woman had been teaching them for years, preparing them for the arrival of white-skinned Christians, the curiosity about Sister Maria arose when someone inquired at the church, asking if anyone knew of a sister teaching Indian Christianity in New Spain. To everyone's surprise, Sister Maria confirmed that she was indeed the one. Despite objections due to her never leaving Castile physically, she insisted she had done so in spirit, this revelation prompted a letter to Father Benavides in New Spain urging him to investigate this peculiar situation. Father Benavides was encouraged to visit and speak with her, as something extraordinary seemed to be happening, Sister Maria provided detailed descriptions of tribes' clothing and customs, knowledge seemingly beyond her reach as a cloistered nun, which was accurate. Dr. Donald Powell Wilson was a prison psychiatrist back in the late 1940s at USP Leavenworth, a big jail in Kansas at Fort Leavenworth. This place was the biggest high-security federal prison in the USA at the time, and it held all sorts of criminals, serial killers, spies, bank robbers, drug bosses, and gangsters from the Prohibition era. One of the inmates was a guy named Haddad and Dr. Wilson wrote about him in a book about his three years at Leavenworth. According to Wilson, Haddad was a guy who had killed multiple times and had a strange reputation. Haddad's past was mysterious, and there were stories about where he came from. His records were always changing or disappearing. And he had a habit of vanishing during transfers between prisons. But oddly enough, he would show up later, knocking on the prison gate, asking to be let back in, even though Haddad could escape without anyone noticing, Wilson said he was a nice, cooperative, and charming person. In Wilson's book, Haddad was described as a tall convict of Senegalese descent with some psychopathic traits. Haddad claimed to be an astrologer from Chaldea with a family history going back to 400 BC. He said he studied at the universities of Carthage and Oxford and worked as a zombie priest in Haiti, 
Haddad shook up the mood in prisons with his strange and puzzling presence. People said he could do magic, hypnosis, and teleportation. Some even thought he had ties to voodoo and devil worship. But Wilson, who had to check on him in solitary confinement after a teleportation incident, thought Haddad was just polite, despite the rumors. There was talk that Haddad could pretend to be dead and then come back to life without a scratch. But what really got Wilson's attention was his teleportation skill. He'd vanish and reappear in different places, like showing up at a concert in Kansas City. When Wilson asked why Haddad didn't use his powers to escape prison, Haddad said he was on a mission. He claimed he was hunting down evil spirits and taking away their physical form. Plus, he wanted to share his spiritual knowledge with the right people. According to Haddad, Wilson and his colleague were just the right candidates for that mission, Haddad suggested a special ceremony to start something, and it included a blood ritual at midnight in his cell all alone. Haddad promised Wilson that after this ceremony, the doctor would change completely, learning secret things and staying young forever. Even though the offer sounded interesting, Wilson politely said no. He mentioned that he respects Haddad's hypnotic skills but is scared because Haddad has a history of being dangerous. In June 1968, Dr. Gerardo Vidal and his wife were driving along National Route 2 from a small town just outside of Buenos Aires, Argentina. They were following another couple in their car, all set to visit family and friends. Suddenly, a strange green fog surrounded their car, the friends in the other car reached their destination, assuming the Vidals were just running late. As time passed with no sign of the Vidals, concern grew. Worried about their missing friends, they retraced their route along Route 2 but couldn't find them, according to reports from that time, the Vidals woke up two days later, bewildered and lost, a whopping 4,000 miles away in rural Mexico. They were in their car, with no memory of what had transpired. Oddly, their vehicle had mysterious scorch marks on its body, yet the engine worked perfectly. Feeling terrified, the couple traveled to Mexico City, where they contacted the Argentine consulate and shared their strange ordeal. The consulate arranged a flight home for the Vidals and facilitated a phone call to their friends, the Rapolini family. In the call, Gerardo explained the bizarre situation they had experienced. Before they flew, the consulate told the Vidals they'd take their car. This made sense as they had to leave it for the plane. But it got weird. The consulate wanted to send the burned car to America for study. They told the Vidals to keep quiet so the authorities could check it without problems. But the news got out. Reports of the Vidal's teleporting became a big deal in the news. The Vidals didn't talk directly to the press, but it was known that the wife went to the hospital because of a nervous problem. She was really shocked after what happened. Because of the strange claims, everything went quiet. Many investigators stopped looking into it, and there were no clear answers. Even Martin Rapolini, who was related to the Vidals, said two days later that the phone call never happened. He claimed not to know the Vidals, which was weird because his sisters were saying the call was real, another weird thing was that Martin appeared to be the only Rapolini left in town. Reporters, excited to cover the story, said all the other family members had run away, probably to avoid more questions. And the weirdness didn't stop there, the Flying Saucer Review, through its Argentine representative, talked about the case a couple of months later. On the same night as Vidal's teleportation, a guy showed up at the town's hospital. He claimed he was driving on Route 2 when a strange fog covered his car, making him feel shaky and sick. Local newspapers also said some folks saw UFOs in the sky that night. This made people think aliens might be connected to Vidal's teleportation, with many suspecting abduction, even though these events were said to be mind-blowing, the case soon disappeared from public talk. Then, in 1996, a filmmaker spilled the beans in an interview. He said the whole story was made up to promote a movie he released right after the Vidals vanished. The movie was a funny musical about UFOs and teleportation. But if you take a closer look, this explanation falls apart. 
Not only was the movie a comedy, and supposedly advertised using a case that ended with a woman having a nervous breakdown in the hospital, but the Vidal's teleportation story didn't even mention UFOs. And the whole thing got hushed up pretty quickly, which might have made the marketing plan not work so well, and why wait 28 years before saying this. Plus, the movie didn't do well at all. The only thing that connects the movie to the Vidals is that the car in the film is the same one the Vidals supposedly drove. It makes you wonder if someone is just trying to get attention for their movie by saying something that's hard to check because it happened so long ago, with all the confusion, misinformation, and mixed up details, the Vidal case seems to be like many other UFO stories that are more believable. Carlos Mirabelli was a famous guy from Brazil who could do some really cool stuff. People knew him for doing things that seemed like magic, like floating in the air and moving things with his mind. But the craziest thing he could do was teleport. Back in 1926, Carlos was getting on a train in Sao Paulo with his buddies. Right before getting on the train, poof, he disappeared into thin air. It was daytime, and there were a bunch of people around who saw him slowly fade away like he was being erased, his friends were shocked, but things got weirder. About 15 minutes later, a guy from the train station came up to them and said Carlos had called. Wait, what? Carlos was on the phone, saying he was now in a town called Sao Vicente, which was 56 miles away from where the train was going, he said it happened super fast, and when he arrived, only two minutes had passed since he disappeared at the train station in Sao Paulo. Imagine that, disappearing and reappearing in a totally different place in just a few minutes. This is the end of today's episode, I hope you enjoyed it, please like, comment and share the video with your friends, subscribe to the channel as well, I will see you soon with another mystical episode, take care.